Hello and welcome to Scott Plays. Today I'm taking a second look at Marvel Champions. This is the newest cooperative living card game from Fantasy Flight Games. It was designed by Michael Boggs, Nate French and Caleb Grace. Now I took a look at this game uh, back in, well about six months ago I think, um, shortly after I got it and had played a couple of games, uh, but wanted to revisit it because I've played significantly more games now, both in physical form and on Tabletop Simulator. Okay, so let's take a look inside this box. Now, normally I'd go into exactly what you get in the game. Um, I'm gonna sort of cover that, but I have a number of expansions. I've taken out the insert. I've got replacement tokens and all sorts of things in here. So it's not gonna be my normal overview of the components. Um, what I will say though is, first thing you're gonna see is two rule books, uh, as is normal with Fantasy Flight games these days. You get a learn to play and rules reference. I will come back to both of these during my uh, thoughts at the end of the video, but yeah, your standard how to play the game and reference for the rules booklets. You also get a couple of punch boards and I'll quickly go over what you'll see on those. Just put those out of the way. Um, there's, if I remember rightly, there's two punch boards. One of them mostly contains um, the bits for five dials. There are four small ones that are for player health, um, and then one large one that is for villain health. You'll also get uh, on the punch boards a number of tokens of assorted types. As I said, I've replaced my tokens with uh, third party tokens, um, but these are the original cardboard ones. These are health tokens. Um, this is for when you're dealing damage to uh, minions or if your allies get damaged you use these tokens instead of dials. Um, some people like to actually use these for their heroes as well uh, and there's um, one scenario in particular where these be become useful for tracking hero health. Uh, there are some green generic counters, various cards do various things with these. Um, yeah, there are ones and threes. Um, I should have said with the health tokens, there are ones, threes and fives. And then there are yellow threat tokens. Uh, again, ones, threes, and fives. These are used to track the progress of the villain's scheming, which will make more sense in a bit when I, I explain the way the, the game works. And then you get a, a first player marker and a number of these, what are called acceleration tokens that just have a plus one on them. Um, again, I'll explain those. And of course you get your trusty proof of purchase. <laughs> there are also two types of cards. Um, there are small, um, I think they are mini American sized status cards. There are three types of these. Uh, 
Let me see if I can grab a few of these. So, so you have tough cards, stunned cards, and confused cards. I think there are 10 of each type, something like that. And then a whole load of sort of poker or Magic the Gathering sized cards in various types. Uh, so these are uh, a selection of aggression aspect cards, for example. Um, over here I've got some uh, reference cards and then various villain related cards which I'll I'll go over those in a bit more detail in a moment. Okay let's talk about the art and the graphic design. Now it's Fantasy Flight, it's a Marvel IP you would expect art to be fantastic. You'd expect the graphic design to be really good. You know, um, Fantasy Flight are one of the best in the industry, in my opinion. And I mean, the the Learn to Play guide is a great example of this. It's just so well laid out. Everything is really clear. The illustrations are great. They, they show you clearly what the text is telling you. Yeah, nice bits of comic book art. Um, some of the card art is taken straight from the comics. Some of it is commissioned art. Uh, there are... A small number of um, particularly card art pieces that I and quite a few people do not consider to be great art. That said, if you take the game as a whole, I would say it is excellent art and graphic design with just one or two or maybe three or four um, examples where it's not as good as the rest of it. So let's talk a bit about how the game actually plays. The game is a cooperative LCG. So the players are working together to thwart the scheming of a villain. You will choose the villain at the start of the game. Um, unlike the Arkham Horror game, currently there's no ongoing story or campaign or anything. They are bringing out a campaign or story box, I think they're calling it, for, for this game, which will have a bit of a... Um, narrative to it um, but the, the sort of standard way to play is you choose one villain that you will face and the players each choose a hero that they're going to play as um, it's a deck construction game so you can customize your decks uh, up front um, it's all of the expansion hero packs and the heroes that come in the core set have starter decks with the expansion heroes um, let me just grab this one um, we have here the the Doctor Strange pack. Um, this is came recently. I haven't opened it yet. Um, 
yeah, the these come as a pre-built deck. So you get, what was it, 60 cards. There's your hero identity card. There's um, 15 signature cards. Five, what was it, uh, an obligation and five nemesis cards. And then a 40, no, it'll be, it makes up a 40 card deck, so it'll be 25 aspect cards, or cards from a single aspect. Um, Doctor Strange is actually slightly different because he has what's called a invocation deck, which I think is five cards. Um, so yeah, his deck is slightly different. Um, but then you also get a number of additional cards from the aspects not used within that hero starter deck. The yeah, the core set heroes are similar in that they have the starter the cards for the starter decks in the core set. However, there are five heroes in the core set and um only four aspects, so you can only ever have four of them built, and two of the heroes sort of share an aspect for their starter deck. Um, but yeah, you can build your decks, customize them before you play, or you can just go with the um, starter decks, and that's one of the nice things about this LCG. Um, Unlike the, all the previous ones, you had to, uh, before you even started playing, I mean, you, you would get a, you would get suggested decks, but generally, before you started playing, you'd have to build a deck and then play. With this, you can just buy a hero pack. And, and they, this is the first time they've done these kind of pre-constructed decks. Um, I understand they are doing these for Arkham now. Um, but yeah, this is it. This started with Marvel Champions, and so if you know somebody that plays and you're considering it, and say you like Doctor Strange particularly, you can just go and buy the Doctor Strange pack, go around your friend's house who has the core set, and just start playing, and you don't need anything else. Obviously, to play the full game, somebody needs a core set. Um, so yeah, the players are taking on the roles of a group of superheroes uh, fighting against a villain. And as I said, you normally choose one villain. The core set comes with three. There are currently two additional uh, scenario packs available. Um, I have one of the packs down here. Uh, this is the Green Goblin pack. Um, this one has been opened and the cards are in the box. Um, these are, I think these are 80 card and this one's 78. I think, it, I think that varies um, from scenario pack to scenario pack. Uh, the other one is the Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew are slightly different in that there are four villains in the pack. Um, Green Goblin is actually slightly different from the, the villains in the core set. So if I go back to the core set, there are three villains in the core set. There is Rhino, Claw, and Ultron. The, these, there is one version of each of those villains that you can choose to fight against. Green Goblin has, or, well, I'd say there's one version, there's one scenario for each of those villains. Green Goblin has two scenarios. Wrecking Crew is different again in that there is only the one scenario, but the Wrecking Crew is formed of four villains and you fight all four villains um, at the same time. 
which I haven't done yet. That's the one scenario I haven't played yet is the Wrecking Crew. Um, so how do you actually play? Uh, okay, so let's move things around a bit and I'll give you a, an example. Um, let's go with Claw because it is May and various um, content creators are clawing their way through May. Um, so, yeah. The standard villain comes with three kind of identity cards. A stage one, stage two, and stage three. There are two sort of normal difficulty levels, if you like, um, standard and expert. If you're playing standard difficulty, you take stages one and two and you fight against those. If you're playing expert, you take stages two and three and you fight against those. They generally also come with a main scheme that will have a number of stages to it. Claw has two stages, Rhino has one, Ultron has three. Um, can't remember with Green Goblin and the Wrecking Crew how many they have, but yeah, that varies. And it's similar to the uh, agendas in Arkham Horror. You start on main scheme one. If that, if the threat on that, and I'll talk about threat in a minute, uh, reaches a certain number, then it progresses on to the next stage. And if you get to the last stage and that progresses, then you lose the game. <coughs> And then each villain comes with a set of encounter cards. They have a standard set and then there are what are called modular sets. So the normal one and the um, first scheme... Um, gives you the the sort of normal setup for the this villain and so yeah claws normal setup is to use the masters of evil modular set um, currently I think there are let me see one two three four five six seven eight nine. Yeah, nine modular sets um, of varying difficulty. Um, one of the nice things they did with the core set was label the difficulty. Um, and again, because Claw is kind of the middle difficulty, then the Masters of Evil modular set is um, difficulty two, Ultron's uh, normal modular set is difficulty three, Rhinos is difficulty one. Um, Corset also comes with two more modular sets that are higher difficulty. They're difficulty four and five. Um, they are really nasty. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, let me think which ones they are. They are... Yes, Legions of Hydra and Doomsday Chair. Uh, Doomsday Chair, for example, you get you get Modok and his biomechanical upgrades. Um, the different modular sets and encounter sets. Also, they will come with. Uh, minions for you to face, they will come with what are called side schemes. These can come out and um, they have additional effects 
you'll get a, a number of threat on there that you need to get rid of to stop that effect from happening essentially. Um, and they also come with more um, what are called treachery cards which are bad events essentially. And so yeah, you choose your villain, you follow the setup for the villain, you end up with a an encounter deck. There is also a, a standard modular set and an expert modular set. So if you're playing on standard difficulty, you just use the standard modular set. If you're playing on expert difficulty where you're facing stages two and three of the villain, then you include the standard modular set and the expert modular set. Okay, so roughly how does a round look? Um, you will have your hero deck. So this is Black Panther, um, one of the five heroes that comes in the core set. Um, you get Black Panther, Captain Marvel, Iron Man, She-Hulk and Spider-Man. Um, I also have Captain America, Ms. Marvel, uh, Thor, Black Widow, and as you saw, Doctor Strange, who I've not yet um, opened. Um, and yeah, as I was saying, you, you get your identity card. Um, the heroes are double-sided. You have your superhero form and your alter ego form. That affects what you can do in your turn. It also affects what the villain does. And I'll, I'll explain that in a bit. Um, you then also get something that's called an obligation. This is a single card. Um, they're generally very similar. Um, every hero comes with a single obligation card that gets shuffled into the villain's encounter deck. And then you get a... There it is. A five card nemesis set. This comes with one Nemesis minion and then a number of other cards that are associated with that Nemesis. Um, occasionally they have other minions. They usually have a side scheme and then some treachery cards. Um, and in fact, the, the standard setup is Nemesis, Minion, Single Side Scheme, three Treachery Cards. Uh, they usually two or three types. Um, and yeah, these are put aside at the start of the game. And if a particular card comes out, uh, and I'll need to dig out. See, I was playing <laughs> against Rhino last time I played this, so I've got the uh, standard and expert. And was I playing against Rhino? Maybe I wasn't. Right. Yeah, maybe I wasn't. Somewhere <laughs> in this box is the standard and the expert cards. And part of uh, part of the standard set is one card in particular that uh, brings out your nemesis set. So whoever draws that card at a particular phase, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, of the or a particular part of the villain phase, um, if you draw this particular card, your nemesis minion engages with you, their side scheme comes out and their encounter cards are shuffled into the encounter deck at that point. So if it's 
getting low, then these are going to definitely come out. Um, yeah, if it's early in the game, then yeah, you'll probably see them because you're probably going to go through the entire encounter deck at least once. Um, but yeah, they give the game a little bit of flavour that is tailored to the hero you are playing, which is a really nice touch. Because um, it, it, yeah, it kind of personalises every scenario. Um, and then you have your hero deck. Now, this is all shuffled together, but what you get is 15 signature cards. You can tell the signature cards because they all have little illustration of the hero on them. Um, your hero identity also has that same illustrated face in the uh, bottom right hand corner. And yeah, all, all 15 signature cards have those. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, Doctor Strange is slightly different in that he comes with an extra I think it's five or six cards that are an invocation deck that um, are in addition to his 15 signature cards. And then you make up the rest of the deck from either a single aspect, of which there are four. So these are spare aspect cards. So the red ones are aggression cards. And as the name suggests, they are mostly about dealing damage in various ways or effects that trigger off dealing damage or attacking or that kind of thing. Um, yellow ones that are justice. This is mostly about stopping the villain from carrying out his evil schemes. Uh, leadership, which is largely about helping your team through allies and boosting those allies and bringing allies back when they've been killed and that kind of thing, or using allies to help... Um, boost what the uh, the heroes are doing. And then there is protection, which is kind of your support role. And these are green. Um, and yeah, that's a, this is about things like giving buffs to allies or players or healing or... Um, yeah, defence buffs, um, a bit of dealing with encounter cards, that kind of thing. There's some, I mean, the, the, the aspects aren't really strict divisions between these different things. So I think long term, all of them are going to be able to do all of these things, but they do them in slightly different ways, and they have sl they are um, they definitely lean towards one uh, aspect of playing the game, and then there are grey neutral cards that do pretty much. Um, all of those other things, uh, they're generally not as powerful as the aspect cards because any hero can take them, and aspect cards are generally not as powerful as the hero signature cards. Um, so yeah, you will have a deck, as I was saying, that is formed of 15 signature cards and then one aspect and as many neutrals as you like up to 
between 40 and 50 cards. Now, currently, there's generally not much reason to go above 40 cards. Some heroes are slightly favour going slightly above. Um, but what it does is when you are constructing a deck, it gives you the freedom to, say, aim for 45 cards. And then you maybe get to... 46 or 47 and there's a, you can't, you're not really sure which ones you want to get rid of so you leave them in and then you play a couple of games and you go okay I, I don't really need this card and that card and you take those out and you get it down to maybe 44 cards and then you play a few more games and that you know you can then from your experience in those games tailor your deck and get it towards the, the 40 count. Um, with most games of this type, having a small as is legal deck is a good thing, and it's certainly true for the majority, if not all, of the current uh, player characters. Um, heroes um, there yeah you're, you're generally wanting to get through your deck so you're seeing all of your cards because you are only putting good cards in your deck if you're putting bad cards in your deck you're doing something wrong <laughs> um, so yeah the the normal um, deck building wisdom is to build towards 40 cards so, we have our heroes, we have our hero decks, we have a villain, they have an encounter deck, they have side schemes. What do we actually do each round on, and on a turn? So, the rounds are split into two phases, and uh, by the way, the game comes with some nice door-sided reference cards on the blue side, you've got the player phase reference, and on the red side, you've got the villain phase reference. Um, these are just a an overview, so they, they don't give you all the detail, but it's enough for certainly your first few games, It's there's enough on there to remind you of what you need to do. And then if you always have the... Um, learn to play or the rules reference handy um, you should have no problem actually walking through a round um, the player phase comes first you will so the two sides of your identity card have a number of things on them one of the things they have is your hand size. They also have your hit points. Your hit points do not change, however your hand size does. And so different turns you can have different hand sizes. Um, on your alter ego side, you, you also have a recover ability, which allows you to heal. On your hero side, you have a thwart attack and defense. Attack, as you might expect, is how you do damage to minions and the villain. Defense is how you prevent damage being done to you. Thwart is how you stop the villain from achieving their scheme. So you will have a hand of cards. And one of the really nice things about this game is Your cards, generally, unless they are resource-generating cards, they will have a cost in the top left-hand corner. Um, this, the resources that you pay to play a card is other cards. Um, at the bottom left-hand corner, there are 
a number of symbols that are the number of resources that that card provides. So these, for example, provide two red resources. Um, there are three, well, there are four types of resources. There's, uh, let me see if I can find the other one here. There we go. <coughs> There's red, yellow, green, and blue. The greens are special in that they are wilds, um, and when you use a wild to pay a cost, you can convert it into any one of the other resource types. Um, blue is kind of, um, I can't remember what it's actually called. It's it's a kind of mental resource. Let me see if I can find, quickly find it in the rules reference. Uh, no, I can't. Okay, let me see if I can quickly find it in the Learn to Play. Yes, it's on the back. Mental, it is mental. So, yeah. Blue is mental resources, yellow is energy, red is physical. Um, when you're playing a card, the type of resource that you use to pay for it doesn't matter, but there will be various effects. Um, so either things that trigger when you pay play a card or things that you have to um, do to get rid of bad cards that will require specific types and yeah those kind of tie in so um, for example claw has some cards that attach to him and uh, actually claws are all spend one of each resource type um, but other other villains for example rhino has a um, armored horn or something like that card that comes out and you know it boosts rhino's attack to get rid of that you need to spend physical resources so that's to represent you physically going up and ripping the armoured horn off Rhino. Um, so yeah, that's really nice uh, thematic touch to the way that the resources use, are used. Um, another good example is uh, Captain, Captain Marvel uses a lot of energy resources. Uh, Black Panther, who we're looking at here, has uh, vibranium, and that comes with two wild resources. So yeah, Black Panther is, is rich because he can generate two resources from one card of any type. Um, yeah, things like that. So yeah, you will be playing cards. There are there are a number of different types. I'm not going to go into all the detail of how you play. Um, if you want to learn to play the game, there are a number of really good videos out there. But just quickly, there are resource cards that you can use to generate resources. Uh, there are upgrades and supports. These go into play next to your or in your tableau and then stay in play. Some of them will get the generic counters and when you want to use the ability of that card, you discard a counter. Some of them are just uh, unlimited uses. Usually it's once per round and Often you will exhaust the card to use it, that kind of thing. Um, and then there are allies. 
allies also have a thwart and attack, and they also have health. They generally also have an ability. So Luke Cage, for example, when he comes into play, he has the toughness ability. So he enters play with a tough status card. Uh, that means when he takes damage the first time, instead of actually taking damage, you get rid of the tough status. Um, yes, yeah, so on your turn, you're going to be playing, you're going to be, you know, exhausting cards to do various things. Your, your hero can exhaust to attack or thwart, um, or if you're uh, damaged, you might want to be in your alter ego form, exhaust to heal or recover to use the, the correct game term. Um, yeah, your allies are going to be doing that as well. You're going to be using your various supports and things to basically try and do damage to the villain. Now, the villain has starting health. Well, each stage of the villain has starting health. So, for example, Claw Stage 1 has 12 per player starting health. Um, so, yeah, in a four-player game, he's going to start with 48 health, and you've got to whittle that down. When he gets to zero, he doesn't... That isn't when you win. When you get the first stage to zero, it goes on to the second stage. If you're playing expert, then you start on the second stage and then go through to the third stage. But basically, you have to defeat the villain twice. Um, he will have a main scheme and may get side schemes out. Uh, you use the thwart, so there will be during the villain phase, which I'll talk about in a minute, there will be... Uh, actually, those are side schemes. There's some main phase, main scheme, and then, yeah, you may have side schemes out. And yeah, they, you'll get threat tokens on them. You can use either your allies, or if you're in hero form, you can exhaust to, to thwart that allows you to remove the threat from schemes to prevent them from completing. And as I said earlier, if they, if the main scheme completes, then you, or the last stage of the main scheme completes, you lose the game. Um, and yeah, if I didn't say the way you win, as you might expect, is to kill the villain. So get through both stages, either stage one and stage two, or stage two and stage three, depending on the difficulty. Okay, so that's pretty much what you're going to be doing on um, during the player phase. The uh, One other thing to talk about is, I, I said you've got a double-sided identity. Uh, you can choose to flip at any point during your turn, but only once per round. There are card effects that will flip you, and if a card effect either forces you to flip or gives you the option of flipping, then that doesn't count towards that once per round. Um, but yeah, the... Um, a, a significant part of the strategy of the game is deciding when you're going to be in hero form and alter ego form. That's partly because some card abilities require you to be in one form or the other. So, for example, Black Panther's Wakanda Forever... Uh, has what is called a, a hero action, which means you must be in hero form to be able to use that action. 
Ancestral knowledge, on the other hand, which is an event. I don't think I mentioned events. Events are one-off things. You pay for them, you play them, they're discarded, or you do whatever the effect is, they're discarded. Um, and yeah, ancestral knowledge is an alter ego action. So you have to be in alter ego form to be able to play that event. Now, as I think I mentioned earlier, that also affects what the villain does. So let's go on to talk about the villain phase. In the villain phase, they will initially add some threat to the main scheme. That's based, again, on the number of players. And most side schemes, the amount of threat that goes on them is based on the number of players. They often have an effect that adds more threat based on the number of players as well. This is the way that they, um, the designers uh, scale the game is by having these per player effects. Um, not Things are not always per player. Uh, there are some, uh, for example, uh, threat thresholds on schemes that are not per player, I think. Uh, and some of the increases are not per player. And that kind of thing. Um, yeah, generally, villain health is per player. But yeah, as I was saying, the at the start of their phase, they will add a number of threats. So let's say we're playing a three-player game. Claw will add three threat to underground distribution, for example. The villain will then activate against each player in player order. As I said, as I mentioned earlier, there is a first player marker. Starts with the first player, goes round clockwise. When they activate, they look at what form you're in, and either they will scheme or they will attack. If you are in alter ego form, they scheme. That basically adds more threat to the main scheme. If they attack, as you would expect, they are looking to do damage to you. They only attack you, or it's it's not right to say they only attack you, but they, when they activate against you, that will only result in an attack if you're in hero form currently. I expect that we will see villains in the future that when they activate, they always attack, or when they activate, they always scheme. Um, one of the Green Goblin forms sort of does that a bit um, yeah he he actually has a two-sided most villains are not two-sided they they just have a uh, standard card back on the back but one of the green goblin um, versions has a double-sided villain card so he actually works a lot like the player identities in that he has a Green Goblin side and a Norman Osborn side and yeah when he's in Norman Osborn uh, form he's generally scheming and doesn't really attack he does something instead of attacking um, and when he's in Green Goblin form that's when he's attacking and that's when he can take damage and yeah when he's in Norman Osborn, you can't damage him, you can only stop him from scheming or reduce his scheming. It's yeah, it's a, it's a really nice design. It actually I'll I'll come back to to that um in the final thoughts. Um but yeah, as I was saying, he the villain will activate uh when they activate they generally get a boost card. Uh, this is a, a face-down card that, you know, if you're being attacked, you 
decide whether you're going to defend. That's when the defense ability comes into effect. Uh, and then you flip the boost card over and they've got little symbols at the bottom right hand corner that increase the effect of their attack or scheming. Uh, some claw in particular will get more than one boost card. Uh, Green Goblin again is, is one that tends to get more than one boost card but through different means than claw. Claw always gets two boost cards which makes him really nasty because uh, he can hit you really hard uh, yeah so they will do that they'll activate against each player and then each player again in player order starting with the first player gets an encounter card dealt with them to them and then in player order you flip them over and at this point you if they are a minion, you put them in front of you engaged, like this one, this armoured guard. If they are a treachery, you do whatever the card says. Some of them will have different effects depending on whether you're in alter ego or hero form. Some of them always do the same thing. Some of them will be additional side schemes. If they're a side scheme, you put them out, you put some threat on there. You check the thing, and yeah, side schemes are, can be really nasty. Uh, in fact, everything in the encounter deck can be really nasty. Um, yeah, and then that is basically the the villain phase. Yeah, the players all uh, resolve their encounter cards. First player marker moves on. And then you go back into the player phase. So hopefully you can see from that that the game plays pretty quickly once you get used to it and you get used to doing all the different steps because there's just the two phases and the two phases are fairly simple. So in the player phase, you are just playing and activating cards. In the villain phase, the villain is adding th threat to the main scheme activating, so either attacking or scheming, against each player individually, and then each player gets an encounter card and resolves that, and that's it. So yeah, game plays really quickly and smoothly. It's really nice. Um, don't think there's really much else to say about the gameplay at this point. Um, I think I'm starting to go into final thoughts, so... Uh, let me think. Oh, status cards. Uh, there are three types of these. Um, tough, confused, and stunned. Confused stops the villains, or also minions have attack and scheme on them as well. And these activate after the villain so and they do whatever the villain was doing um and yeah so uh confused status guards will stop the villain or the minion or a minion from scheming uh stunned cards which are in the middle there um, stop them from attacking tough you generally don't want on villains, but you do want on you or your allies because they, as I think I said earlier, um, prevent damage. Um, and yeah, I think that is it for how the game plays. Okay, final thoughts time. First thing to say is I really like this game, if that wasn't already clear. Um, I think if you've watched my On The Table, you'd probably know that already. And my yeah, my overall opinion of the game hasn't changed since then. It's only improved, if anything. Um, there are a number of things about the game that I... Are, that, that are what make me like it so much. 
Um, the first is the resource system. So every card is a resource. Almost every card requires resources to pay for them. So when you get your hand each round, you are presented with a multitude of options in terms of what you can play and how you pay for those cards. Um, and, and sometimes um, abilities will require payment as well. Uh, so you've got to take those into account. And you need to look at the board state. You need to look at what minions are out, what, how much health the villain has, how close to uh, completing a scheme they are, um, how close you are to removing all of the threat from a scheme. All of those factors... Um, play into your decision making on every single round and that just gives you yes yeah, so many different options um, and I'm, I'm not really sure of or I, I know there are other games that use this uh, discard a card to pay for other cards or discard a number of cards to pay for other cards um, but none of the games that I own do this and, and so it, that that gives it a bit of a unique uh, position in my collection um, there is also uh, something I didn't really mention during the, the gameplay and rules section is that in multiplayer you can request actions from other players um, as long as it's the ability that you're requesting is an action um, then you can request it um, some things are not actions uh, I'm not going to go into the detail of that but yes yeah, suffice to say there are some things you can ask other players to do and um, or they can offer to do them so um, a good example is in the leadership aspect. There is a card that allows you to pull cards, pull allies out of any player's discard pile. There is also an ally in that same aspect that when she is played, or when she enters play, I think is the exact wording she causes everybody to draw a card so if you are a leadership player and it's you're not the first player that round but you have that card which is called make the call and you know that you or somebody else has that ally Maria Hill in a discard pile you can say hold on let me play, make the call, or yeah, I can't remember exactly how the how it's worded in the rules, but you can basically offer to do an action. You can play, make the call. You can get Maria Hill out. Everybody draws a card at the beginning of the round, even though it's not your turn. You're doing that, and that creates a level of interaction and cooperation amongst the players that is like nothing else that I've seen in any other game. I mean, I also play the Arkham Horror LCG. Um, I've played numerous other uh both card-based and non-card-based um, cooperative games, and a lot of the times you have your turn, you do your things, and those things help everybody, but they don't 
directly interact with what the other players are doing. But in this game, because you've got that requesting and offering actions ability, they absolutely do. Um, another example is um, Black Panther has this Wakanda Forever card and he has a set of um, upgrades that are bits of his suit. Um, Iron Man is similar but he doesn't have this um, aspect of needing a card to activate his bits of, the bits of his suit. Um, and what you can do as the Black Panther player is you can see that, okay, I've got my claws out. I've got Wakanda forever in hand. It's not my turn, but I can see that if I can kill the minion that is in front of another player that has this ability called guard that stops that player from hitting the villain, that then frees up that other player that is, say, um, let's see, who hits hard? Uh, Captain Marvel, for example. She's got some um, abilities and cards that can do a large amount of damage with a single action. Um, and yeah, if Captain Marvel gets a guard minion in front of her, she can be shut down quite badly but you know the Black Panther player can go well there let me play Wakanda forever I can get rid of that minion then you can do what you were going to do on your turn um, and yeah so you, you've got all that you've got that interplay between the different players and the different heroes and um, it which brings me into one of the other things I really like about the game, it makes you feel like you are a superhero. I mean, obviously, you, you know, you're playing a game and it is abstracted and so you don't really feel like, but it, it, it gives you that sense of being a superhero, being part of a superhero team and taking on a villain and taking them down and doing really clever stuff uh, to, to, yeah, to defeat your enemy. Um, uh, what else is, is there? The, I mean, I, I, I've talked about the, the art and the graphic design earlier and yeah, that, it's just, it's just really nice. Um, the, inventiveness I mean it, we've had two scenario packs um, and uh, one two three four five hero packs at this point I think yeah yeah five um, and certainly with the scenarios in particular, they're doing really interesting things. And in fact, the heroes as well, and particularly the, the latest ones. Um, yeah, Black Widow plays completely differently from any other hero in the game. Um, she has uh, what are called preparation guards that are reactive. So you spend most of the game <laughs> playing these preparation cards and doing nothing else <laughs> on your turn. Uh, and then in the villain phase, the villain does something and you go, well, I'll just do this <laughs> to stop that. And um, yes, a, a minion comes out and you go, oh, I'll, I'll deal it two damage. And uh, because I did that, I'll also deal another damage to this minion over here and that kills that minion. And it, it, it's just really nice and she kind of then builds up to the point where actually on her turn she can then do lots of thwarting or lots of damage and yeah she's just brilliant um who else is there that plays really nicely oh thor 
Thor is great. Thor, uh, his his starter deck is a bit. Mm, I don't know if it's weak or it's difficult to play. I haven't played it enough to determine that yet. Um, but yeah, he he likes grabbing minions and dealing damage to them, and he he has area of effect damage. Uh, Captain America has that a bit with his shield. You can bounce it off minions. Um, yeah, Iron Man. There's one of the um, corset heroes. He spends half the game, or well, maybe not half the game, but a a few rounds building his suit, and then he once you get his suit out, or most of his suit out, he becomes really powerful. <laughs> you know, he and he it really feels like Iron Man. And and yeah, just the, the variation in the way all of the heroes plays is just so good. And the scenarios are, are the same. The the three in the core set are kind of similar-ish when you compare them to the other two. Um, but they even those do different things. Uh, Rhino is very basic, very easy to beat. Um, he is a an introductory villain. Um, Claw has lots of attachments that make him better. He has that he goes through his encounter deck uh, quickly. And another thing I didn't mention during the gameplay and rules section is if you if the encounter deck or your deck runs out then bad stuff happens so that makes claw particularly bad uh, he I think he has quite a few minions um, and certainly with the yeah yeah he has quite a few minions and with his default uh, modular set of the masters of evil that brings in even more minions and they're really nasty minions um, so yeah he's he's got a minion heavy effect heavy burning through the deck kind of uh, villain um, Ultron has drones he can take cards from your deck and turn them into drones so I mean, like, for example, Maria Hill that I mentioned earlier, I was playing a game um, a couple of days ago. And, yeah, a uh, player that had Maria Hill, she got turned into a drone at some point, and they, they come out face down, so you don't even know that until you defeat the drone, and then you discard it, and then you get to find out that, oh, it was Maria Hill... My deck had uh, Nick Fury and somebody else. I can't remember. It was the Black Widow deck, anyway. Um, yeah, Black Widow starter deck. Uh, if if you know that deck, you'll know it has a couple of really good allies in. And yeah, they got turned into drones, and it's just horrible because it it's a card that you haven't had access to. Uh, unless you have a way of pulling cards out of your discard pile, which there aren't many effects that do that in the game at the moment. Um, yeah, I think I think Make the Call is actually the only one that does it, and it is only... Actually, no, there are other ways of getting cards out, but the, yeah, there's very few effects that pull cards out of the uh, discard pile. So, yeah, what... We'll, once a card has become a drone, even when you get it back, it's it's a card that is not available to you. So yeah, that that's really nasty. And he makes lots of them. So he's kind of a swarm villain. Uh, you need ways of dealing with minions when you're fighting Ultron. He also has um, attachments to make him tougher. Uh, he doesn't go through his deck quickly, but he's hard to beat. He has high health. He's really tough. He has a lot of defences uh, in terms of just getting minions out, drones to just protect him. Um, 
because you can't, even though they're, they're little 1-1-1 one, 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 uh, minions, so one scheme, one attack, one health, you can't leave them. You, you have to deal with them at some point. Um, I, some characters can kind of ignore them. Uh, sort of Iron Man, uh, once you get his suit on, you can just ignore the drones because you are hitting for so much. Same with Captain Marvel. She just hits so hard that you can just go, okay, ignore the drones. As long as you don't have a guard and there are... Um, I think it's the advanced drone in Ultron has guard. Guard stops you from hitting the the villain. Um, yeah, a claw has guard minions. Um, the armored guard, <laughs> just nasty, so nasty. Um, yeah, oh, and things like weapons runner, weapons runner. Uh, when you play it, when it when it comes out as an encounter card and you play it, it has Surge, which means you get another encounter card. So, like, yeah, so you're not only getting a... I mean, they're, they're not nasty minions, but you get a minion and you get something else nasty. Um, and, yeah, Armoured Guard is the, the one with, with Guard and it has Toughness. So, yeah, it comes out with a tough status and it has Guard and it's got three health. Just, yeah, it's, um, but yeah, the the other scenario packs, so Green Goblin, um, I've, I've got Wrecking Crew, uh, they're, they're in here, and they're around somewhere, um, the box is around somewhere, um, but yeah, Green Goblin comes with two scenarios, they're very different, um, the yeah, as I think I think I mentioned earlier, I think probably during gameplay and rules, uh, one version of Green Goblin has is double sided, like the uh, player identities. So you have to juggle that to be able to win. Um, it's actually fairly easy to do because you can. Um, yeah, basically get him to flip into uh, Green Goblin form and then you just stay in hero form and deal damage to him. It, it's an, but it's still, it's still a really nice idea and it, it can be quite fun to play. And I think with some of the, the um, difficulty adjustments, they... Oh, suggestions for adjusting the difficulty um, you can actually have a really tough game of, of that version of Green Goblin the other version of Green Goblin is a bit more like Ultron um, basically he is it's mutagen formula he's producing um, a goblin army so you get lots of minions coming out um, that one is really tough. It's it's a hard scenario to beat, particularly in higher difficulty. Um, the Wrecking Crew has four villains that um, only one of them will activate against you each round, and that changes. Uh, but you can attack any of them, so you can manage which ones um, are going to attack you because it's based on the threat I think on their side scheme um, yeah it's it's like the, there is one main scheme and each villain has a, a side scheme the side schemes are not like the normal villain main schemes in the when they reach their threat threshold it's not game over um, a bad thing happens and then the threat resets. So yeah, that one is all about... I, I haven't played it yet, but my understanding is it's all about managing which of the four villains will activate because you can determine that based on how much thwarting you do, I think. Um, so yeah, it, it shows that they're, they're being really 
inventive with the scenarios. Um, and we've got the uh, Brides of Red Skull story pack coming, uh, which apparently will introduce a story mode. Um, whether you'll be able to adapt that story mode for different villains isn't clear. That would be very nice um, if you can do that. But what is known is that it, it will have a, a overarching narrative. Now you play through, I think it's five villains that are coming in that, and you play through them in, in order and how you do and what you choose to do in earlier scenarios will affect later scenarios, probably based on what they've said in the article. Um, and you can also get cards that you can add to your deck. It's not probably not going to be quite up to the um, Arkham Horror um, deck upgrading um, based on the the article. Uh, but yeah, that that's going to be a nice additional way of playing the game. And yeah, they they've said you can play each of the villains in that set uh, in the standard way where you just take one of them and you face that one and you don't play it in campaign mode but they also introducing a campaign mode um, and from what we've seen of those villains they work differently as well uh, so yeah the the amount of variation they're putting into the way that the heroes and the villains all work um, is really nice um, so that's all the good stuff um, there are always of course not great things with any game um, there are very few with this game actually uh, one is I, th I think I mentioned during the art and graphic design some of the illustrations that they use are not brilliant. Um, let me grab, I think this is Black Widow. Yeah, this is Black Widow. There is one card in here in particular. There he is. Winter Soldier, that illustration is just, I I don't know what they were thinking <laughs> using that <laughs> illustration. I, mean, I don't want to, it's not original comic art, I don't think. I, I, yeah, I, if I remember rightly, the ones that don't have an artist credited are from the comics the ones that do are commissioned art and I, I you know I don't you know art is very subjective and so I, I don't want to say that it, it's just out and out bad but I really don't like it it's not uh, yeah I, I I don't know how to put it into words without being horribly critical. And yeah, it take a look at the art, get get a card image up on um Marvel C D B and take a look at it for yourself. I think it's not the best art in the game, <laughs> let's put it that way. But so much more of it and, and, and I suppose the, the, the thing is the contrast it's you know when you compare it to most of the other art it is just it's a, it's I don't know I don't know I, yeah I mean I don't want to be really critical of of artwork because art is so subjective um, but it's it's hard not to be critical of that particular illustration um, and so yeah I think I I kind of I, th I think you know you've got the Marvel IP license 
you've got access to a massive library of art assets from what I understand they they have pretty much as it's probably not the whole of the art available to them but they it it's certainly the case that if they are aware of a panel that they really like they can ask Marvel to if they can use that panel and I would expect that like 99% of the time Marvel are going to say yes of course you can use it um, and there has that just has to be better <laughs> images of Winter Soldier than that um, right another negative thing is the rules reference it's Again, it's really difficult for me to be very critical. Um, it's it's not the worst rules reference I've ever seen. I mean, uh, the yeah, I mean, there are games that I own that their rule books are awful <laughs> as rules references. This one is not that bad. Most stuff in here is fine. But they have now updated this. And you can download the PDF of this. They've updated it, I think, four times. And there is a rework coming that it's not clear how significant the changes are going to be but the feeling is they are going to be quite significant there are a couple of things that have changed in the the first six months of the game's lifespan that have changed the way the game plays significantly um there are other things, there's, I mean, for example, there is a section that was added to the rules reference for the term you, which you would think would be quite simple, you know. It's a, it's a common everyday word. We all pretty much know what it means. However... When you start using it on cards, it can cause confusion. And so they added an entry into the rules reference for the word you. It didn't clarify <laughs> a lot of the situations. Um, I've... I've arrived at an understanding of you that I think is what the designers intend, but I couldn't back that up with text that is in either the printed or the digital rules reference. I can sort of back up most of it and I can sort of say well I think this bit is just written badly and if you change the way that that's written then it backs up my interpretation of the rules but we shouldn't be in that position there is Oh, I was going to say worse change to the rules reference than that. Um, more significant, I, I guess, is better than worse. Um, some abilities have in their ability text a action type in brackets. Um, these are attack, defense, and thwart. And what the printed 
rules reference says is that these abilities count as the type of action that is stated. So, so your, your hero, they can exhaust to do a basic attack. They can also have cards that have this attack in brackets, which means that when you play that, it counts as them attacking, even though they're not exhausting to attack. The thwart works the same way. And in the printed rules reference, defense works the same way. But in the latest update, digital update to the rules reference, they have changed the way defense works significantly. So that rather than it being this effect counts as a defense, it has become, you can only use this. I'd have to double check. It's either you can only use it when you're being attacked or when you defend. I think it's when you, you are being attacked. I think. Or is it when you exhaust? But it, yeah, it's completely changed the meaning and it, it's changed the function of a number of cards. Um, and again, that shouldn't be the case. It, it, you know, the Arkham Horror rules reference, I mean, yes, it's had numerous updates and yes, the FAQ for that is huge. But most of the FAQ is clarification. There haven't been major changes to the rules. And yeah, the Arkham Horror rules reference, or as far as I'm aware, I've been a little out of touch on Arkham Horror, so if there's been anything in the last year, then I may have missed it. But as far as I'm aware, there have been no major changes. And Arkham Horror has been out for three, four years. Marvel Champions is six months old. And it's already had a major change to the way one part of the rules work. There are also issues with timing that where some card effects are just not clear. There's, there's at least one um, that has been uh, clarified with errata where um, the certain effects are either um, interrupts or uh, responses and this one card, it was printed as a response when, if it is a response, it just doesn't work. Um, responses occur after the effect that triggers them. Interrupts occur before the effect that triggers them in basic terms. Um, and yeah, this one card, if it's, a, if it's a response as it's printed on the card, it just does not work. It cannot work. And yeah, they have said, yeah, that is an error and it has been corrected. But then there are other ones that are just unclear uh, and there are lots of timing questions. There are lots of questions about you and this change to defence is throwing up lots of questions. And it feels like, and certainly from listening to interviews, I get the impression that more time was needed on the development of the game and whether it was FFG, higher, people higher up in FFG, people in Asmodee or Marvel putting pressure on the designers, it's unclear but I certainly get the impression that 
somebody put pressure on the designers and the developers to get it ready sooner than they would have preferred then and not enough work was done getting the rules reference right um, another thing that is missing from the rules reference that is in other LCG rules references um, and is definitely in Arkham um, is a timing chart and although timing charts don't answer all of the questions that come up they would answer most of them and apparently these things are being worked on but obviously they, they're also having to work on new content at the same time and so they're under you know pressure to do that and I, I just feel like they could have delayed it, the release a year and got the game right probably didn't even need to be delayed a year um, a year would make sense because of Gen Con. Now, of course, COVID-19 happened and that would have changed everything. But And, of course, that's changing the amount of work they can do at the moment. Uh, so, yeah, I, I've got a lot of sympathy for them currently. And if my suspicions are right, I got a huge amount of sympathy from the designers and the developers uh, but yeah more time should have been given to getting the rules reference right in the first place and it wasn't however all those negatives don't take away from the game, the game is still fantastic it Between this and Arkham Horror card game, they are about equal for me. Um, I had played a little bit of uh, Legend of the Five Rings. I'd looked at Netrunner, uh, and I think I talked about this in the on the table. In that, for me. Cooperative LCGs suit me much better at the moment. Um, yeah, in the past, I would have been all over Netrunner. It, it, I played the 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 original Netrunner a bit, uh, not very much. There, there weren't enough people around um, that I knew that played it. Um, but I, yeah, I played like one or two games of it. Really liked it and. If there'd have been more of a, a scene, or if the FFG Netrunner had come out back then, I'd have been all over it. And actually, I probably didn't have the money to, to, to do it then, but um, yeah, I, I certainly would have wanted to. And I probably actually, actually, yeah, I was buying magic cards, so yeah, I probably did have the money. Yeah, um, yeah, back in the back in the days when I was buying and playing Magic, then, yeah, Netrunner, uh, Legend of the Five Rings, the other competitive LCGs would have been great. But these days, particularly because I can play them solo, and just, I, I yeah, I... The scene... Um, and the community is so much better with the co cooperative LCGs. And, and so Marvel and Arkham, they both hold a very high rank in my collection. I can't really separate the two. Um, Marvel is better for solo play. I can, you know, quickly, particularly keeping decks built, I can just pull a deck, I can, um, and generally I will keep one of the um, villain scenarios built, um, so I can just pull that, 
shuffle the cards up, start playing, and yeah, even the the longer scenarios play really quickly. Um, when you're playing like Ultron four, three or four players, it can take a long time. <laughs> um, the game I played the other day on tabletop simulators, it was, it was like four and a half hours. But a game against Rhino solo, you're looking at 15, 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, it sets up, tears down really quickly, plays really fast. Um, and so yeah, the overall feelings about the game is it is very, very good. And as I think I said in my on the table video, if you like the IP, you like the style of game, go out and get, or at least get yourself in a position where you can try <laughs> Marvel Champions, because it is very, very good. Um, yeah. Excellent game. Excellent, excellent game. Okay, this has been quite a long video, but I, I wanted to make sure I, I covered everything I wanted to say, um, particularly in the, the final thoughts section. Um, thank you for watching, if you are still watching at this point. Uh, if you could subscribe, like, do all the usual stuff, that would be great. Um, Facebook group, MeWe group, you know all the things. Um, Links in the description. Yeah, all of that. Um, yeah, I hope you'll join me for another video at some point in the future. Hopefully I won't be, or it won't be quite so long before I do another one. Um, I keep saying that, never happens. <laughs> um, yeah, life, yeah, <laughs> just. Anyway, as I said, thanks for watching.